How would you feel if the United States was invaded by China? I heard a bunch of mumbling. How would you react if you were watching the news and all of a sudden this big breaking news alert comes on and says, China has landed 10,000 soldiers in Washington, D.C.? The first news that I heard of 9-11, I won't tell you the whole story, but the man told me that planes were flying over the United States and dropping bombs. That was my first introduction to 9-11. Gordon, you were going to say something? <laughs> Head to the safe for some self-defense. How would we feel right here in Swartz Creek, Michigan if the Chinese took over? Let's say they killed everybody, killed all the congressmen, the president, every, all the leaders, all the political leaders, and they said, we are now in charge. How would you feel? Yeah, that'd be right at the top of the list, wouldn't it? <laughs> you think we have enough hunters in the United States to fend off a million man army well, they say China's got a million men in their army Probably wouldn't be long before they decided they'd made a mistake. What if the whole time they're invading and killing all of the politicians and setting themselves up as our government, what if that whole time I'm standing here in Schwartz Creek, Michigan telling you, leave it alone, that's God's will? Then what would you say? Don't worry about it. Leave the politicians alone and leave the Chinese alone in Washington, D.C. It's God's will. Let's just keep leaving as Christians. Then how would we respond? Would we go to the safe then? Would we go to the safe then? <laughs> what do you know about the book of Lamentations? That's what you know about it, huh? Does anybody know anything? I heard <laughs> oh, thanks, Daniel. You just set the tone for the rest of the class. <laughs> very dry. Well, from Jeremiah's perspective, it was very wet. What do you know, Mary? Okay, it got so bad that women were eating their children. You're correct. What got so bad? What's the it that, that you're referring to? Well, the Babylonians came in and they took away in three ways. Yep. And uh, there was no food, no water. Yep. So the Babylonians invaded. They cut off their food supply, motivated the Israelites, at least some of them, to start eating their own children. Cut off other kind of supplies. 
Now what does that have to do with Lamentations? Right. And that's what Lamentations is about, right? So here's a map of the Middle East. You're familiar with it, or you ought to be familiar with it. There's Assyria right there. Assyria, capital city, Nineveh. Uh, they had invaded in 722 B.C., and they had carried off the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes of Israel, into captivity and Assyrians had moved other peoples, including some Babylonians, into Israel, and those people intermarried. And that's where we get the Samaritans from that we know of in the New Testament. And then down here, we've got the Babylonians, with the capital at Babylon. There's Ur, where Abraham was from. Over here is Persia. Uh, Susa was the capital of Elam, but then when Persia took over Elam, Susa became uh, a capital of Persia. So anyway, there's Babylon. And most of the time when they invaded, they, they came north and then turned west and went south. So, the Babylonians invade southern Israel, which is called Judah by this time. This is 130 years after the Assyrians had invaded, 130 years later. Now, Sunday night, we're going to be studying a Amos three chapters out of Amos, and Amos is living during that first period of tragedy when Assyria invaded, invades. Jeremiah lives during the Babylonian invasion, and here's a timeline. Uh, Mary mentioned three deportations. There's uh, one deportation there. It's probably when Daniel, um, Ezekiel, Oh, there's Ezekiel there. They're dating Ezekiel. So Daniel was carried away there in the first deportation. There's the second deportation and the third deportation when Jerusalem is destroyed. So if you could put yourself in a situation where our capital has been invaded by the Chinese and how that would make you feel, and how it would make you feel to see them lower the American flag, let's say over the Pentagon or over the White House, and raise the Chinese flag. And here I am telling you, don't worry about it, it's all God's plan. Your insides are going to say, no, I want to fight. They're destroying my country. Then this little podunk preacher over here is saying, no, everything's okay. You just need to trust God. If that real life scenario would, would happen... It'd be interesting to see how many Christians I would have here on a Sunday morning. COVID aside, how many people would continue listening to me preach if I'm saying, let the Chinese invade, let them do what they want to do, we just need to stay faithful to God. And I say that because we as Christians in America have intertwined Americanism with Christianity so much that we would find it hard to be Christians if our country is not free despite all those other countries where people, Christians, have to learn to be Christians in a country that is not friendly to their Christianity. So Babylon was on the plains of Iraq. Let's go back and get some background because we're trying to lay the background, lay the foundation for understanding the message of Lamentations and what we learn about God from this book. Babylon was located in the Fertile Crescent. And go back and look at the Fertile Crescent. You're familiar with that, I'm sure. Watered by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They grew wheat and dates. Had a lot of grazing land that supported a large population. Akkad is the region to the north where the capital city Babylon was located. Sumer is the region of the south where Ur was located, as I pointed out, where Abraham was from. In some documents, that area is called Sumer and Akkad, Akkad. But it was also called after its capital city, Babylon, or Babylonia, from around 1800 B.C. It's also referred to as the land of the Chaldeans. Now, we see in Daniel that he refers to those people as the Chaldeans. Chaldeans was a part of the group that became Babylonians. 
So it's, it, uh, it appears from the records that Chaldeans was a, uh, an ethnic group or a racial group who, who merged into uh, the Babylonians. The earliest inhabitants were Semites. Now what do I mean when I say they were Semites? The Jews are Semites. Which means what? Noah had three sons, right? Ham, Japheth, and Shem. All of those people that descended from Shem are Semites. Which means that the Jews and the Babylonians were cousins, if you go back far enough to Noah. Their language was a pictograph language. Sumerian, using a cuneiform script. Chaldean is another language, another dialect that took over influence once the Chaldeans rose to power within the empire. And then Aramaic was also having an influence and it took over with the rise of the Persian Empire. Now Jesus and the Jews in the first century spoke Aramaic. They did not speak Hebrew. Hebrew was a language of the educated Jews. The common Jews spoke Aramaic. If you were educated enough, then you spoke Greek. Uh, the Apostle Paul spoke apparently all three languages. One ruler in Babylon that you probably have heard about before is Hammurabi. He was a statesman, he was a military planner, he was a lawgiver. His laws are some of the oldest writings in human history outside of the Bible. The law code of Hammurabi was first found by the French in 1901 and 1902. The law was found on a black stone steel containing 282 laws. It's now in the museum in Paris, France, if you want to go look at it. For those of us who are students of the Bible, the law code of Hammurabi is interesting as we compare it to the law of Moses because it's roughly contemporary with the law of Moses. However, despite the similarities, uh, the law of Moses is much more humane, uh, especially with prisoners of war than the law code of Hammurabi. Now, from around this period of time, Hammurabi, we have several pieces of Babylonian or Sumerian literature, a couple of them that you've probably heard about. The Atrahasis is an account of the creation. It's better known as the Enuma Elish. And I'll point out to you, uh, this god, primeval Apsu, was the progenitor of uh, humanity. Uh, Tiamat was the female... Uh, counterpart, uh, no gods at all had been brought forth. Now, what's the problem with that? What's a theological problem with saying no gods have been brought forth? I ain't worshiping a god that's been created. Yeah, or brought forth by other gods, but you can't have a god that's been created. By definition, that God is not worthy of trust, not worthy of worship, not worthy of anything. Uh, so let's see, then the gods formed within, um, look at this, when gods were man. Now, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormon Church, believes that, gods, that men become gods when they die and go to the next life. Uh, drudgery of the gods... My God doesn't drudge, right? Our God doesn't get tired in anything he does. Uh, these gods were, had forced labor. The Epic of Gilgamesh is the Babylonian counterpart to the story of Noah. Uh, Upnapishtim is Noah. Uh, the great gods resolved to send a, flood, send a deluge, a flood. He was to build a ship, build an ark, save a life. Uh, take aboard the seat of all living things. Let her width and length be equal. The boat that Utnapishtim built was a cube. What happens if you drop a cube into water? It tips over, right? <laughs> That's how silly it is. Why? Because it was created by man. It wasn't created by God. Uh... 
and he responds, he'll faithfully execute the commands of God. So let's take a little, little closer look at who these Babylonians were. During the Middle Babylonian Empire, which was contemporary with our book of Judges, we have Nebuchadnezzar I who was reigning. And Babylonia went through a period of time when Assyria was in control. Tiglath-Pileser III of Assyria was in control of Babylon and he took the title King of Sumer and Akkad as well as the King of Babylon, 729 B.C. The Assyrians put Nebuchadnezzar on the throne in Babylon, but he consolidated power, especially in the face of Assyrian weakness, and he was able to lead Babylon to independence. Now in 616, 615 B.C., the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians, and then their crown prince Nebuchadnezzar II comes to the throne. With the help of the Medes, the Babylonians were able to conquer Asher in 614 B.C. and Nineveh, the capital, in 612 B.C. So the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians and the Egyptians, 609 B.C. and the Egyptians at Carchemish in 605 B.C., which is when King Josiah was killed. 2 Kings chapter 24 and verse 7 says that the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Babylon is mentioned extensively 294 times in the Bible. 282 times are in the Old Testament beginning with 2 Kings 17 and verse 24. In the history books from 2 Kings to Esther, Babylon is mentioned 60 times. The book of Psalms, Babylon is mentioned 219 times in the prophets. Especially Jeremiah, notice 169 times in Jeremiah. It's because Jeremiah is dealing with Babylon. If China were to invade the United States over the next 12 months, how many times would I mention China in my sermons? Ezekiel and Daniel. After Daniel, Babylon is in the Bible once, and Micah, and twice, and Zechariah. When Nebuchadnezzar returned to Babylon to assume the throne at the death of his father, his lieutenants followed, taking control of most of Palestine, Syria, Palestine. Now, because Israel's king, King Jehoiakim, had sided with Egypt against Babylon, the Nebuchadnezzar decided that he was going to retaliate against Judah. Now, we have found some documents that record this from Babylon's perspective called the Babylonian Chronicle, and it reports that Nebuchadnezzar besieged the city of Judah, capturing it on the second day of the month, Adaru, March the 16th, 597 B.C. He took the king, Jehoiakim, and put a king of his own choice, Madaniah, whose name he changed to Zedekiah, he put him on the throne. And he took a, a whole lot of spoil from the city and he sent it all back to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar himself is mentioned 91 times in the Old Testament, quite often by Daniel, because Daniel served Nebuchadnezzar in the White House, so to speak. The last king of Judah, Zedekiah, also revolted against Nebuchadnezzar which finally brought down the wrath of Babylon over Judah. As we already mentioned, Babylon invades three times, takes, takes away royalty, leaders, priests, anybody who could be a leader, they take them into captivity, into exile in Babylon. They do it once, they do it twice. After this last rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar, he was fed up with it, and so this time... Jerusalem is sacked, and the temple is destroyed. In 587 B.C. ought to be burned into your memory as a student of the Bible. It is a red-letter date. It is the fall of Israel at the hands of the Babylonians. The Babylonians later will seize Tyre as well as Egypt as they march across Palestine and across that area. Nebuchadnezzar was succeeded by his son, Amel Marduk, who's mentioned in the Old Testament as evil Merodach. The next on the throne was Neraglosser, and then Labasi Marduk, 
Incidentally, Marduk is a god of the Babylonians. And he's mentioned once in Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 2. Babylon, as all, uh, as all nations have to do, had trouble defending its own borders. For them, it was against the Medians and the Lydians. The Babylonian king Nabonidus had to move his capital to Tema in northwest Arabia around 553 B.C., and he ruled from exile. But with the support of Egypt and the Persians, he returned to Babylon. The son of Nabonidus is named Belshazzar. I think I have that on there. Yeah. His name was Belshazzar. Belshazzar reigned with his dad for a period of time, and then he was killed, and immediately Cyrus from Persia stormed into Babylon October the 29th, 539 B.C. We can, we can nail that date down on the calendar pretty firmly. And an independent Babylon came to an end and ceased to exist. The Persians now come to the throne and reign over that area of the world, including Israel. So the book of Lamentations was written by Jeremiah. Let me give you a little bit of information about Jeremiah before we take a look at Lamentations itself. Jeremiah is the son of a priest, which means Jeremiah is from what tribe? Levi. Levi. So Jeremiah could have been carried into exile. Daniel is carried into exile, and Daniel serves in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. Ezekiel is also carried into exile. Ezekiel was from a priestly family as well, but he wound up getting stuck with the Israelites themselves. Jeremiah is left in Israel. So Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel are contemporaries, preaching to Jews, but in three different places. But they're all preaching at the same time. But Jeremiah, of course, was also a prophet. He was from Anathoth, which was uh, just a little bit north of Jerusalem. He was not married. And he was the only prophet that God actually forbid to marry, Jeremiah chapter 16. And most scholars believe that Jeremiah is the one who wrote the book of Lamentations. Lamentations officially is anonymous. But early Jews believe that Jeremiah wrote it. Jeremiah several times in the book of Jeremiah refers to weeping over Jerusalem, which would fit Lamentations. And those who know the Hebrew language thoroughly say that the language and the grammar and so forth of Lamentations fits the book of Jeremiah and the same author. Just briefly, look at what Jeremiah went through as he was trying to tell his people, don't worry about Babylon invading the capital city, you just stay faithful to God. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. His brethren dealt treacherously with him. He was confronted by false prophets. His brethren cursed him. He was struck and put in stocks and denounced. His heart was broken. He was seized and threatened with death. His teaching was opposed. He was imprisoned. He was pursued. He was beaten and imprisoned. He was thrown into a dungeon. He was bound in chains. He was falsely accused. And eventually, despite the fact that he kept trying to tell his people, don't rely on Egypt, he was dragged off into Egypt. And so far as we know, that's where he died. Still trying to tell his people, just stay faithful to God. It doesn't matter who, who sits in the White House, just stay faithful to God. Lamentations is a unique book. It's similar to Psalms 119 in this respect. I put the Hebrew up there and you can't tell that you're just going to have to take my word for it. But I want you to look at chapter 1. How many verses does chapter 1 have? 22 verses. How many verses does chapter 2 have? 22. How many verses does chapter 4 have? 22. How many? 22. How many verses does chapter 5 have? 22. How many verses does chapter 3 have now? 
How many? 66, which is a multiple of 22. The Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters in it. And every letter, every verse rather, in chapter 1 begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. A, B, C, Olive, Bet, Gimel, A, B, C, all the way through Tav, all the way through Z. Same thing with chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter, uh, chapter 4, rather, and chapter 5. Chapter 3, every three verses begins with the same letter. Now, Psalms chapter 119 does the same thing. And Psalms 119 is written in praise of the law of God. It's written in praise of the commandments of God, the statutes of God, the word of God. Lots of different synonyms for the word of God in Psalms 119. Lamentations is written as a funeral song for the destruction of their beloved capital city. Now, to show that it was written in this way as an acrostic illustrates the heart that Jeremiah put into this, the passion, the thought that he put into this, as he seriously wept over the destruction of his beloved capital city. King David conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites. King David reigned roughly around 1000 BC, which meant Jerusalem was the capital city, and Jerusalem was chosen by God. It was the capital city that God chose for his people. God says, I'm going to put my name there, and I'm going to bless it. But by 587 BC, Jerusalem wasn't God's city anymore. It was full of idolatry and unfaithfulness. As we're going to study Sunday night from Amos, it was full of wealthy Israelites who were content living their lives without any concern for anybody else. The poor, the needy, they had no concern. They were laying in their beds of ivory and they were eating their choice meats and listening to their musicians, oftentimes at the expense of the poor and the needy in the land. So we're going to take a few weeks to, it won't take us real long to get through all of Lamentations, but we're going to spend a few weeks looking at this book and seeing what we can learn about our Christian lives from this book. So let's take a moment and look at verses 1 through 11. I hope you have your Bibles open to Lamentations. It's right after Jeremiah. How lonely sits the city that was full of people, she has become a widow who was once great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a forced laborer. She weeps bitterly in the night and her tears are on her cheeks. She has none to comfort her. Among all her lovers, all her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile under affliction and under harsh servitude. She dwells among the nations, but she has found no rest. All her pursuers have overtaken her in the midst of distress. The roads of Zion are in mourning because no one comes to the appointed feasts. All her gates are desolate. Her priests are groaning. Her virgins are afflicted, and she herself is bitter. Her adversaries have become her masters. Her enemies prosper, for the Lord has caused her grief because of the multitude of her transgressions. Her little ones have gone away, 
as captives before the adversary. All her majesty has departed from the daughter of Zion. Her princes have become like deer. They found no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. In the days of her affliction and homelessness, Jerusalem remembers all her precious things that were from the days of old, when her people fell into the hand of the adversary, and no one helped her. The adversary saw her. They mocked at her ruin. Jerusalem sinned greatly. Therefore she has become an unclean thing. All who honored her despise her because they have seen her nakedness. Even she herself groans and turns away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She did not consider her future. Therefore she has fallen astonishingly. She has no comforter. See, O Lord, my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself. The adversary has stretched out his hand over all her precious things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, the ones whom you commanded that they should not enter into your congregation. All her people groan seeking bread. They have given her precious things for food to restore their lives themselves. See, O Lord, and look, for I am despised. Who is Israel's lovers that are mentioned in verse 2? Her enemies? Wouldn't it be the countries that Jerusalem, or not, not the countries, the gods that, uh, yeah, the other religion, that they were worshiping the idols, that they did not stay with God alone? Yeah, so rather than trusting in God, right, wasn't Israel pictured as being the wife of God? But rather than trusting in God, she trusted in these other nations around. The enemies of Israel. And their gods. So they're trusting in all of these, not Babylon, not at this particular time. They trusted in Babylon before under Assyria. That didn't prove to be helpful. At this time, mainly they're trusting in uh, Egypt. But some other nations like Arabia... Tyre, Sidon, uh, those are some of the other countries that Jeremiah uh, would critique. Why are you going to put your trust in those people when they're going to be punished as well? So she's put her trust in her lovers. And Babylon is going to invade them as well. As I mentioned, as I ran briefly through the history, Babylon doesn't stop at invading Israel. The Israelites grabbed Jeremiah and dragged him into Egypt in order to escape Babylon. But guess what Babylon did? They followed him right into Egypt. Now, question on the screen. What is the application for us? If we just stop right there, what's the application for us? So we never need to read the Old Testament without saying, okay, how am I going to apply this to me? Now, we have to apply it through the lens of Christianity. But how do we apply it to us today? Yes.
That's exactly right. Now, you may have not have heard what Gordon said, so I'm going to put in my own words. Uh, but uh, on, a, on an individual basis, as a congregation of people, as Christians in general, we have to be careful who we put our trust in. We need to ultimately put our trust in God and in His Word. Israel was deceived and they were led astray and they thought, well, in fact, what, what was our response? China invades uh, the United States, what are we going to do? We're going to run to our safe. We're going to grab our guns. Israel had a military as well. But it doesn't matter how many hunters we have in the United States, if the wrath of God is coming from above, we ain't stopping it. So we need to be careful who we put our trust in. Yes. <laughs> Trusting in Republicans is not enough. And that's true. Um, when we had our, our Christian uh, leadership training camp about three summers ago, one of our teenage girls was in the class. And I was walking around. I don't remember what book we were studying, but I always have everybody reading from the text. And I was walking around as they were reading. And I looked over her shoulder as she was reading, and her Bible is all marked up. And a marked up Bible is a sign of a growing Christian. And I told her, I said, don't you marry a guy who does not respect the fact that your Bible is marked up. I said the same thing with one of Jules' uh, sweet mates. We were at the lectureship, and they were sitting in front of us at one of the evening lectures. Uh, and we have singing uh, during the, the lectures as well. So as I was standing up, sitting down or whatever, I happened to look over her shoulder and noticed that her Bible was marked up. So I told her the same thing. And now I've seen her picture on Facebook because she was in Jewel's wedding, so I'm friends with her on Facebook, and I saw a picture of her with this, with this young man in, in the picture. And so I want to send her a message that said, Who is this guy and is he going to help you get to heaven? That's the number one question. Who are we going to trust? Who are we going to listen to? Because human beings can deceive us. Intentionally or unintentionally. That's why we need to go to the Bible. We need to make hard choices. That's what the, uh, what the uh, donut is about up there. I first prepared this uh, slide for the the teenagers when we were having the devotional on Tuesday nights in between Bishop and Jared. So I went through lamentations with them. If that donut has got 220 calories, it would take me 20 minutes of doing burpees to burn off those calories. And burpees are not a fun exercise. If you don't know what a burpee is, you jump up in the air and then you hit the floor, you do a push-up, and then you jump back up in the air. Do that for 20 minutes. That's a, that, that exercise exercises you from head to toe. It's not worth it. That donut is not worth 20 minutes of burpees. I ain't doing it. When it comes to relationships that we have in this life, that's the point that we've got to get across to our teenagers. You've got to make the hard choices now because it makes life easier. And it allows heaven to be a whole lot more real to you if you put your trust in the right place. Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. That was one of Israel's kings who said that. He was guided by the Holy Spirit, of course. But they ignored Him. We're roughly quitting time. Anybody have any thoughts? I looked at the next slide and I don't want to get into the next slide in five minutes. Read through chapter 1 and ask yourself, what does this verse teach us as Christians? Now, we know the Old Testament is not binding on us as Christians. So any 
principles, any teachings have to be consistent with what Christ teaches. So if we can filter it through Christ's teachings and say, okay, yes, it's still relevant today, then it still has a message for us. Yes, in what way, and I'm thinking of two major ways, but what are you thinking? In what way does it show God's character? That, that is a very, that's not exactly what I was thinking, but yeah, that's a very good point. The principles on which God relates to man have not changed. From the Garden of Eden, God said, don't eat the fruit. Trust me, you don't want to eat the fruit. That's trust, loyalty, and obedience. Adam and Eve chose to listen to Satan. Those two principles ran through all throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament as well, of course. We question sometimes why, but that's not for us to do. Our is just to trust and obey. Yep. Now Habakkuk, when you when you bring up the question of why Habakkuk lives at this same time, and Habakkuk asks that very question to God. Habakkuk is one of those few people that actually has the blessing of entering into a dialogue with God. And Habakkuk says, God, why are you allowing uh, all this evil to go on in my country? Does that not sound like something anybody has said recently? Why are you allowing all this evil to, to happen in our country? And you know what God's response was? You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to bring the Babylonians and invade your country. And they're going to wipe you out. And Habakkuk says, God, how can you do that? You are of such pure eyes, you cannot look upon evil. That's Habakkuk 1 and verse 13. How can you do that? Babylon is worse than we are. And God says, you, you just don't know. You don't understand. You just trust me. Stay faithful. And everything will be okay in the end. And the destruction of Jerusalem, we see the two sides of God's nature. We see his wrath. These are his own people that he brought out of Egypt to prepare them for the coming of Christ. But because of their idolatry and disobedience, he wiped them out. He destroyed their city. He wiped out their temple. But then we also see the grace of God because he didn't give up on them. He let them stay there and and wallow in their misery for 70 years. And then he brought them back to get them ready a second time for the coming of the Messiah. It's all about discipline. So before we quit tonight, turn over to chapter 3. Because at the very heart of the book, at the heart of all of this negativity and pessimism and spanking, to use the, the disciplinary idea, is the grace of God. It's the dad who has spanked his child and then put her on his lap and hugged her and said, I love you and I don't want you to misbehave. Verse 22, the Lord's loving kindnesses. And loving kindness here is loyalty. Chesed is the Hebrew word. It's lo loyalty. It's God being loyal to the covenant he made with Israel. And he's loyal because he loves them. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great, God, is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. So as we go through and talk about all the discipline that God implements on Israel, we're not going to forget that God was also gracious to them. Okay, that's all of our class tonight. We'll get through all of chapter 1 next week. We're dismissed.